talking about any takeaways you had from the last week. Um, anything, anything stick out to you? Anything bother you? <laughs> anything, uh, like my, my dad would say, anything stick in your craw uh, <laughs> from the last time that we talked? Do we need me to use this for the recording purposes? What? Okay, yeah. Yeah, what, what, uh, what, what were you thinking about after last time? Where were the points of confusion or where was uh, something that you never thought about before? Yeah, say Martha. Hey, I, I wasn't here last week, but yeah. I spent the week reading your book. Mm, okay. Uh, and I think it was not your book, but the book that you recommended. Oh, uh, Universe Next Door? Uh-huh. Yeah. And um, it seems to me that there are a lot of churches these days that are doing that, um, I, think it's, I think it was called Theological Existentialism. Mm. Uh, at least, or maybe it was theological um, nihilism, you know, mm. where they they're saying they believe, but they're not living like they believe. Yeah. Right. That's a good point. So the the existentialist says that that life appears to us to be meaningless. And it seems as if we are all that we have. And the theistic existentialist says, okay, well then let's take a leap of faith and um, hope that God catches us. But it is ultimately a leap in the dark. So Soren Kierkegaard is a a theistic existentialist. And Kierkegaard, he was actually really good at diagnosing the human problem. He calls it despair, which is something like sin and anxiety mixed together. Um, and so, yeah, for Kierkegaard, his, his book, um, The Sick and Son to Death, actually is a really great way to understand yourself better. You realize, I mean, for example, there's, um, there's like the despair of, of necessity. That's when all of the options to you are closed and you feel like, like you, you don't have a choice in what you have to do next. There's so many things pressing against you. Have, has anybody ever felt like this before? Where like all of life is basically closed doors <laughs> and all I have is just this one maybe potential way to go forward, but that makes you kind of fail to live up to um, being a self before God. The other one would be the despair of possibility. This happens a lot when you're young, where there's so many possibilities open to you that you can't possibly act on any of them, and you, you, just, you hope that you can do something. Um, but if you fail to act, that is to fail to trust in God, for Kierkegaard, um, then you ultimately fail to be a self. You're actually not even a, a, an existing self. Um, you're just stuck in your despair, your anxiety, and your sin. So th- I think there's some things that are helpful with theistic existentialism for sure. Um, when you read, uh, if you've read The Brothers Karamazov by, um, uh, by uh, Dostoevsky, uh, very strong existentialist themes, but from a theistic perspective. But the atheistic existentialist essentially says, well, it seems like we don't have any knowledge that God exists, so let's just try to make some meaning of things. Um, the problem is that with a lot of churches, I think you're right, to kind of go in that atheistic existentialist direction. If you remove truth from the Christian worldview, this is something that's very important to understand your own worldview. If you remove truth from the Christian worldview, then all you have is, I hope that it works. And, um, and so a lot of times, like um, more uh, theologically liberal churches, and by theologically liberal, I mean they've typically rejected truth claims of Christianity. What those churches will do is they just, they have action. <laughs> they have uh, initiatives and, and things that they do as a church to try to um, have, show, you know, to build some kind of social justice in the world. But it's never, never centered upon the discipleship of the person becoming more holy uh, learning, to, learning to love Jesus more. Um, uh, gathered practices like receiving communion are, are definitely secondary. And that's why a lot of theologically liberal churches are closing. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Anybody else? Things that kind of stuck out to you from last week? Yes. Can we get a copy of your PhD dissertation? Yeah, it's, um, it's actually, if you search for it um, on, on Google, you'll find it. Yeah, uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna use a way to find it easier, search for T space. Um, yeah, you can find it from the University of Toronto. T space what? Uh, if you just search for my last name, uh, Andrew Shepherdson, 
Um, and then um, I think I haven't given you that as a footnote yet, um, but, it, but it's called Who's Afraid of the Unmoved Mover. It's my first book too. Is the same is the same title. So if you don't find my dissertation, you can buy my book and I'll get thirty cents. So you know, <laughs> it just depends whether or not you want me to have thirty cents. Uh, yeah. Yeah, God cannot lie. He cannot. Yeah. He cannot cease to exist. So God, in all of his power, cannot cause himself to cease to exist because that would be to deny his nature. Yeah, if, if you're an eternal being, you can't say, stop being eternal. And people think that that, that um, challenges or impugns God's power. But it just means that God isn't absurd, right? God can't lie. He's a truth teller. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good thing too, right? Because like these are the little these little conundrums that come up when people are like, "Well, wait a minute! Like, isn't God so strong that He can create a rock so big that He couldn't lift it?" Because either way, you seem like you're kind of pushed into a corner, right? Well, the the better way to answer those kinds of questions is just don't ask absurd questions. Um, it's like when somebody asks you, "When are you going to stop hitting your dog?" That's the fallacy of the false question. I'm not hitting my dog. <laughs> like, I don't hit my dog. It's a false question, right? Well, cool. Well, let's let's move on here. And so, you know, this is a, a class on Christian worldview. I have very specific things that I've planned every week. Like last week, we talked about the doctrine of God. But if you if you think back to what we actually talked about last week, it was a lot of questions about other things too. And that's great. <laughs> Just so you know, like I'm trying to like to go through like a specific set of things. But if you have questions, especially things that are related to think, to people you deeply care about, uh, relationships in your life. Feel free to take us off, to off topic for a minute. I'll probably come back to topic um, before too long, but ask questions. Ask good questions. Um, so this week we're going to talk about the Christian story and humanity. Um, the Christian story, what, what is it? And there's a lot of ways to think about it, but if you remember, a worldview is, again, the, the story that you tell yourself about reality. And you can tell yourself the story of reality in different ways. For a lot of people, the story of reality is like, I have true statements that I believe, propositions that I believe. Like, I am a human being, like I'm married to so-and-so, like I, I, uh, I'm, I have this profession. And that's part of your worldview. Um, if, you, if you say to yourself, my faith is in Jesus Christ, that's part of your worldview. But that's like a proposition. A lot of times people's worldviews are driven by the stories that they tell themselves, though. Uh, whether or not their true stories is sort of secondary. Um, whether or not those stories agree with other aspects of their lives. Like last week, I think I mentioned that there are Christians who believe in karma. Um, uh, you know, that's, those are two stories about reality. One, the Christian story, and one, karma, which is built on an Eastern pantheistic worldview, which totally disagree with one another. Now, karma is, of course, different than you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow is true. <laughs> Jesus said that. But karma is like, when you die, you'll pay off your debt from the past life, and even in other past lives. Um, and you do that through reincarnation. Karma requires reincarnation, and Christians don't believe in reincarnation. We believe in resurrection. Um, so anyway, we, we can talk more about those distinctions as we go. But the whole point is that the stories don't have to agree. And if you look at yourself, there's ways in which, and I, of course, my, me, myself, there are ways in which the stories that you believe about reality are contradictory. That's part of being a human. Uh, of course, what we aim for, what we want to do, is to become more fully formed Christians, conform to the image of Christ, but also we want our, our beliefs and our commitments to match up with one another. This is tricky, because there's a lot going against you. You remember last week when you talked about how fish don't ask why it's wet? There are things in our culture which you've just assumed to be true because you're in our culture. Like the purpose of life is being happy. It takes a little while for you to realize, wait a minute, that's not the purpose of life. <laughs> that's not the purpose of life at all. But it takes a minute to figure that out. And it's because you're swimming in a, in a pond where everybody thinks that the purpose of life is to be happy. You've probably never challenged that assumption before. So part of what we want to do in a course like this is to think through those assumptions. What is true and what is just what I've inherited from my parents, my background, the culture around me? The stories I've told myself about things. Um, and I think the stories that you tell yourself, even kind of subconsciously, 
Uh, those are actually really powerful. Like if you've told yourself that season, whatever it was, that was a real losing season in my life. That was a really tough time. If you tell yourself that a lot, you'll actually believe it. And you might be wrong. Maybe that was actually a really good season. Maybe God delivered you from some, from some really bad stuff. It was just painful. Right? So understanding and interpreting your own life's events, those are important for your worldview. Okay, well, let's get back to the outline here. Uh, what is the Christian story? Does everybody have an outline? I think uh, Brenda has, uh, Pastor Brenda has extras of these. Okay. If you don't, just sh- she'll get you one. So what do we mean by story? What is the Christian story? Well, I don't mean that it's a false story. Sometimes when we say the word story, you think of things like, like Hansel and Gretel, right? Um, and that's not exactly what I'm talking about when I say the word story here. Um, what I mean is that we have a, a narrative, a structure for understanding what the world is all about. And the structure for Christians is, is, is a true story. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis actually called it myth become fact, which I think is kind of a cool way of thinking of it. Because when, he's, when he uses the word myth, he says, it's like this story represents our deepest longings, but it happens to be true. <laughs> so the story, of, of, from a Christian perspective, it starts with creation. So the creation is that God created a world and made it good. So God is the, is the hero of this story. He's the one, and that's, again, another worldview assumption. Do you think that you're the hero of the story? <laughs> Are you the central character in the story? Well, no, from the Christian perspective, God is. Right? And so God creates everything, and he makes it good. So he, he creates a system that works. He creates a world where things are beautiful, and where, where there is true moral goodness, there's true aesthetic goodness, where there is political goodness, because he's in charge. He reigns and rules over everything. Um, but that's, of course, just the beginning of the story. Part of the beginning of the story is he creates humanity in his image. We'll talk about that tonight quite a bit. But given, uh, giving uh, or creating humanity, God creates them in such a way that he wants to give them free will. Recognizing that this story will become more beautiful over time if humans have some kind of power uh, to choose between alternatives. Uh, philosophers call this the power of contrary choice. You can choose A or B genuinely. Um, so uh, God gives them free will, but humans break faith with God and they rebel. They miss the mark of God's perfection is one way that we talk about sin in the Christian worldview. And that means that there is a fall. So creation, fall. And the fall is catastrophic. And we could spend weeks just talking about what the fall means with respect to creation. It, uh, and the fall inside of a human is catastrophic. Carl Henry calls it a catastrophic personality shock. Um, But it's catastrophic to all of creation as well. And through the fall, this is, as Christians, we understand this is why the world is broken. Um, And this gets to issues of human identity. Why would a boy who uh, has an X and a Y chromosome, why would he start to think that he's a girl? Because of the fall. Things are broken. This world is a broken place. Why is it that that there are uh, weather patterns which should be bringing rain but actually bring hurricanes? Because of the fall. The world's broken. And it's deeply broken. It's not just kind of broken. It's incredibly broken. Now, is it irrevocably broken? Is it totally broken all the time? No. Because in the middle of the brokenness of the world, we still see true goodness, right? You can see true beauty. Even though that same hurricane uh, can destroy homes uh, when, it, when it washes, when it, when it you know, kind of uh, dissipates and goes away, you see a beautiful beach and gentle waves. And that's true aesthetic beauty, beauty that God made, right? So the world's not completely broken all the time, but it shows these signs of brokenness, and these signs are deeply embedded in everything inside of the world. But even in the brokenness of the world, you see this in the Adam and Eve story, that brokenness doesn't have the, it doesn't have the last word. So in the Adam and Eve story, you remember what they do when they sin? They cover themselves with leaves. And then what happens once God and and Adam and Eve actually start talking? Well, he says, hey, look, there's going to be some consequences for for what you've done here. One of the most important consequences that he says is that uh, he says to Eve, your desire will be to rule over your husband, but he will rule over you. Um, And actually in your Bible, it typically says your desire will be for your husband. But the word desire there is actually desire to dominate. Um, it's It's an important translation. Uh, note. <laughs> your desire will be to dominate your husband, but he's going to dominate you. This is not God saying, men, be in charge of your wives. This is saying that there's going to be a power struggle. 
And it's a bad thing. And if you look at you know, your own life, your own marriages, like it's, it's a power struggle. Because in our sin, we always try to say, well, who's the boss? Who's in charge? The Christian worldview is totally different than asking that question, by the way. <laughs> the Christian worldview is, how can I serve you? That's the Christian worldview, by the way, <laughs> with marriage. That's why, it, why Paul later on says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he qualifies by saying, of course, wives to your husbands. Right? But he's saying, submit to one another. See how you can serve one another. Be like Jesus, who was a servant. That's, what, that's, that's the way this is supposed to work. But it, the fall is deeply catastrophic in all these things. Um, and so then you have, you, but they get back to the Adam and Eve story. What God says, God says that your desire is going to be to dominate your husband, but he's going to rule over you. And then God kills an animal and uses the skin to cover Adam and Eve. Well, isn't that an important point in the story? That is an announcement of the gospel, that sin is so bad that something has to die to cover over it. Right? So this is what um, theologians have called as a proto-evangelium. An announcement of the gospel. Evangelium is is gospel. It's an announcement of the gospel prior to the full announcement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the fall is 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 important and it's it ruins everything. (laughs) But not irrevocably, not irretrievably, because God shows right after the fall, hey, I have a plan. Sin is a big deal, but I'm going to cover it. In fact, the word atonement, if you've heard Christians talk about atonement, by the way, atonement does not mean at one meant. That's, um, that, atonement literally means covering over. Uh, at one that's like using an English word to determine what Hebrews thought about theology. That's not, that's totally false. Um, so, a- atonement means covering over. And that's what, what happened to Adam and Eve. They were covered over with the skin of the animal. And that's exactly what happens with us when, when we talk about being covered by the blood of the lamb. So, we're, we're, the, our sin is atoned for, it's covered over. So anyway, that's the the fall. And that announces the beginning of the redemption. And you see this throughout the Hebrew prophets, that God is saying, I have a plan to start bringing about my blessing in the world. You actually see this plan with Abraham. Did you know that that God's plan for people is announced in Abraham? That the gospel of Jesus Christ is actually announced in Abraham? What does God say to Abraham? He says, through you, all peoples will be blessed. This is Genesis 12. Well, (laughs) how's that going to happen? Because one of Abraham's descendants is Jesus Christ. So God's announcing, hey, I have a plan to bless everybody through, through your family. And that's why the Jewish people are so important. And by the way, the church didn't replace the Jewish people. Because God, it was still God's plan through the Jewish people to save everybody. All right, God still has a plan for the Jews. The church is just an initial, uh, another part of his plan. But it's always been part of his plan. God's first plan to save the Jews didn't fail. And then he decided to, well, I'll go and save the Gentiles instead. And then I'll create a church. No, his plan was always to bless all nations through, through Abraham's offspring. So, okay, so you have this redemption. It starts to get announced. And the redemption is definitively established in the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. So the work of Jesus Christ, and actually I would add incarnation to that as well when he was born. So you see that, that the redemption is, is definitively established in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. But the redemption continues. And it, and, it, and it continues to this day. The age of the church is, is the age of God's redemption of the world. But that's not the end of it either. Because the redemption has just been announced, but it will be completed, or someone would say consummated, or fully restored at the last day when Jesus returns. That's the Christian story. And everything about your life and mine should be interpreted through that big story. It's a big story, and I told it really fast. But that's the Christian story. It's creation, fall, redemption. And then ultimately, final redemption or consummation. Before I move on, any thoughts or questions about what I just described? Yes, Brian. Where does does heaven, all things are made new, no sorrow, no no suffering, no pain, and that seems like that's being restored, you talk about being broken, where does that fit in to this model? Yeah, so the question is, when is it that we have the kind of full restoration here? Well, it's in, it's in Revelation 21 and 22. So 21, you know, I saw new heaven and new, new earth, and it goes on and says, behold, I'm making everything new. Um, that's Revelation 21, 5. Um, and then he says to me, it is done. That's verse 6, right? Um, so yes, uh, that is the final redemption. 
So that's as the redemption is completed at the last day you know, when the Lord returns. That is. That's part of the story too. That's right. Yeah. And the thing is too is that you know the goal of heaven isn't, or the goal of, of Christian life isn't to die and go to heaven either, right? It's new creation, right? Dying and going to, and going to heaven. That's like that's great, and we're all going to like it <laughs> uh, when that happens. Um, and that, that's actually really important too because I have a buddy who just died. Um, he was very young. He was uh, 29 years old. Um, he had sickle cell trait, and he got he um, he got mono and. He was a healthy guy. He was a Lakewood police agent. And um, just in a couple of days was dead. It was a very sad thing. But like the thing is, is that we realized when we were you know, going through his services and his final events was, uh, you know, he, uh, he's not sad about this. <laughs> and so when you, when you die and go to heaven, that would be a beautiful thing. But being in the presence of Jesus, disembodied, is not the point. Because think back to the creation. God made you with a body. And that's a good thing. Right? And so at the final restoration, what are you going to have again? You'll have a body. Right? So the, the being with Jesus in paradise is going to be, you're going to like that. Um, but you know, you're not going to be dancing in heaven because you don't have legs. <laughs> uh, you maybe you'll have some, some kind of dancing, but you'll have a spirit, you know? So maybe there's something that, I don't know what that'll look like. Uh, but you know, the, the dancing is at the new heavens and the new earth. Like my daughter says, it's when heaven comes down to earth, not when you die and go to heaven. The final redemption is when heaven comes down to earth, and that's, that's the final state, right? But this is important because, and we'll go back to this in a second. You could start to think that your body doesn't matter, but it actually really does. <laughs> um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. I want to talk, though, about this creation, fall, redemption motif, because it's helpful when you're talking to people who have a non-Christian worldview to see how this way of telling a story actually exists across other worldviews as well. There's just different answers to what creation, fall, and re redemption mean. So this pattern, think of them as like hooks, creation, fall, redemption. You can look at other worldviews and understand it according to that pattern. So, for example, Marxism. In the beginning was the material world. <laughs> Matter is all that there is. Marxists are atheists, right? In the beginning was the material world, and it was good because matter is, is, is a good thing. Uh, human life is ultimately a good thing. Um, well, how, does, how, do things, how do things fall? Well, people who have take and they accumulate more, and they control so much capital that they end up controlling the means of production. And they use the means of production to make workers be alienated against their own labor. That is, laborers will work for the people who have, and the laborers will work and give up their labor, which is the only thing that they have, and they will end up giving all of the results of their labor over to the person who controls the means of production. So the worker becomes a kind of slave to the owner. So that's the fall. And that alienation against your own labor, that's a weird phrase, but what, what Marx was saying is that the basic human problem is that the workers give up everything they have and then get nothing. And it means that they keep working for nothing. And, and uh, now that may not necessarily be a true story, but you get the idea, right? It's that they're, they're, they give them their whole selves and absolutely lose it. And then they die. And that's why Marx hated religion so much, because religion tried to comfort people and say, hey, but when you die, it'll be good. Right? Good things will happen then. And he'd say, no, don't just tell them that it'll be good when they die, because this is bad now. And so for Marx, well, how do you redeem all of this? Well, history will get us there if we do nothing. And this is a big thing about Marx, is that he believed that history was actually going in a general direction. That he, and Marxism is ultimately a Christian heresy, because he believed that, that it was possible for things to be set back into an idyllic state again. Um, it's Christianity without Jesus. <laughs> and so he said, well, what do we need to do? Well, you need to have the people who don't have rise up against the people who have. And anything is justified to set this right. Which is why Marxism entails violent revolution. Marxism, by the way, is, is redefined, or re, uh, I should say reinterpreted, by critical theory, which says that the basic problem isn't the haves and the have-nots, the basic problem is the people who have power and the people who don't have power. So whoever are the groups that have power, think white men, all of you are bad here, you're the ones who are bad. 
And the people who don't have power, well, women, of course, but you know who has it the worst is intersectional women, people who are, who are women and minorities. They have it the worst. And of course, this isn't altogether untrue. Women have had it bad in a number of ways, but they've also had it pretty good in a number of ways. Think women don't have to go to war and die, okay? All right, uh, think women don't, aren't killed in industrial accidents nearly as often as men are, okay? So it's not exactly like it's always been all bad all the time. And in fact, most home economies were run in, as a partnership until the last 100 years when men went off to work and women stayed at home. Because most home economies were like a farmer and his wife working together just to try to survive, right? So talk about equality there. It's like <laughs> we're equally uh, at risk of dying from the elements. <laughs> so it's not like it was altogether bad and the men were just always like beating down on the women. But that, according to the Christian story, we do know that that desire for control is, is a perennial human problem. Um, anyway, so but anything anything is is uh, is justified to make this be right again. So the critical theory says, well, let's tax the, the people who have more power. Let's have taxation so that they pay their fair share, right? So let's let's do that. Now, punitive taxation basically says then we can redistribute it and make it more uh, more helpful for the people who have not. And who are the people who have not? Well, especially the intersectionals, people where your your race and your gender or some other thing about you. Intersect, and that makes you a particular um, particular uh, target for those who have power to manipulate and control, and, and ultimately to um, to abuse you. Okay, well that's Marxism, which is why he says workers of the world unite, and he advocated for violent proletariat revolution. Um, and this is why Marxism. I, I don't care. Who, I don't care who you are. Marxism has been tried. It's been tried again and again. In fact, it's one of the longest science experiments that's ever gone on in this world. And there are people out there who say, like, well, true Marxism hasn't really been tried. Yes, it has. All you have to do is look at the, the, the least bad offender, which was probably Che Guevara, killed and imprisoned thousands of his own people. And that's the, that's, he's the best one. <laughs> you get over to the Maos and the Stalins of the world. I mean, you... We literally can't count the bodies in China. We, so many people died, we don't know. Somewhere between 60 and 80 million during the Cultural Revolution. And that was just the 60s and the 70s in China. So we, we, it's so many people that the records couldn't keep up. One in three people in the Soviet Union were informers for the government. That's why the gulags had probably 15 million people die in the gulags. And that's just died in the gulags. There were plenty of people who survived after suffering for years. Sorry, I don't want to talk about Marxism anymore. Let's talk about something that's a little bit... Well, I don't know, this is pretty depressing too. New Age spirituality. <laughs> I'll, go through fast. I'll go fast through this one. What is, what is the creation? It's that you are a self. You're an autonomous self. You are free. And you are the most important thing that exists. Now, what, what's the problem for, for New Age spirituality? What's the fall? Well, it's that you, you are ignorant of the fact of how much power you have. You don't understand how great you really are. But if you, if you realized how much power you had, this world would be a much better place and you'd be much better off. So the problem is ignorance. And what's the redemption to this? Well, it's practices and knowledge, secret knowledge, that you can gain to start to control your own reality. And this is why people like they manifest things. You know, they speak it into existence. You heard about this kind of stuff? If you have a goal or a dream, just continue to say this is, who I, this is who I'll be. This is what I'll have. This is what it will be like. Right? And then if you do that enough, that's a practice that will actually harness your own power as the most important being in the universe and make it so. And the truth is, is that when you think positively about life, like good things do happen to you. I mean, if you, if you tell yourself you're a loser all the time, guess what? It's probably going to go bad for you. But if you tell yourself, like, hey, I bet if I try, it'll go better for me. Usually it does, right? So not, I'm not saying there's no power in positive thinking. But for the new age person, the power is that you are God. And Shirley MacLaine said this. The actress, Shirley MacLaine. She said, you need to know that you are God. Know that you are the universe. That's an important claim. You are the most important thing. You are the entire universe. You are it. You're not responsible for what other people do. You're responsible for you. Does this sound like a Tony Robbins event right now? Yeah, it should, because that's exactly what he does. He's a new age proponent. Okay, let's move on. So that's the Christian story, creation, fall, redemption. And it has all kinds of counterfeits. You could take any other perspective or worldview, and it has some kind of version of creation, fall, and redemption in it. It just seems to be how we think about life, according to those categories. How things were, and they were good then, and they're really bad right now, but they could get better. And we'll probably get there. 
Yeah. Is this pattern also seen in, in other religions as well, Hinduism, Buddhism, and the like? Yeah, in Hinduism, um, it's that uh, uh, the, the, the true reality is Brahman, and it's an impersonal deity. Your problem is you think that you're a, conc you're a concrete individual. You think you're a self, but you actually are Brahman. You are God. Not a personal God, but you're, you're part of this kind of one divine essence. But your sense of self is actually your problem. And what it does is it causes you to be reborn again and again and earn karmic debt that needs to be paid off. And this wheel of reincarnation is something they call samsara. And if you, can, if you can burn off all of your karmic debt, then eventually you'll get to moksha, which is a kind of freedom from that, where you cease to be a self and you go back to being fully Brahman again. Yeah, absolutely. We could do Buddhism too. It's, just, it's similar. Because Buddhism has the, the wheel of samsara as well. Yes? Yeah. So um, Pentecostals can do this. We can think that if we speak something, it can make it happen just by us saying it. Now, that doesn't mean that our words don't have power, and it doesn't mean that we don't have authority. But ultimately, what are we doing if we say, be healed? We're saying, Jesus, in your mercy, heal this person. But the heresy is when you start to think that you have the power to heal. And you know who really likes it when you start doing that? The evil one. And this is why sometimes healers who have started off talking about the name of Jesus, um, they can continue to heal because they have the, the devil's power. If they end up denying God and they think that they have the power to heal, they can end up actually continuing to have that power to heal. What does the scripture say about the evil one? That uh, um, he masquerades as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of the light. So yes, um, that's one way. Pentecostal, we got to be careful. We don't have power to heal anybody. And that's one thing that Pastor Peter teaches like so well. The gifts are not things that you have. They're things that God gives you to give away. <laughs> it's more of like you are sort of like a vessel for God's blessing. That's what the gifts are. It's not like I have the gift of prophecy. It's that no, God ends up giving you prophetic words. You're open to that, so he'll give you a prophetic word and you give it to somebody else. But he's the one who has it. Um, that's one. That's one way. Um, people who deny the fall, there are Christians who deny original sin, and I would say they're no longer orthodox when they do this. Um, but that, but yeah, that's a denial. Um, some Christians who don't believe in a literal second return of Jesus Christ, that's a rejection of the Christian story. You know, um, there are different interpretations of how that happens. Uh, but uh, but if you deny a literal, well, you know, Karl Barth did this. Um, Karl Barth said that, uh, he said ultimately everything that's important happens in kind of a spiritual reality. And everything that happens here is sort of unimportant. And um, so Francis Schaeffer actually put him, put him to task for this. He said, wait a minute. Did, did God create the world out there and point it outside to like a hillside in Switzerland? Because they, you know, they both lived in Switzerland. Did God create that out there? And Karl Barth said, no, um, God created the world in 8033. And what he was saying is that when Jesus died... That was, that was everything that God ever did. And everything that would have happened was in the spiritual reality of, of forgiveness. Whether or not Karl Barth actually believed that God created the world, I think he probably did. He just thought it was unimportant. Which this world, this history, this place now is deeply a part of the biblical perspective on reality. God cares about this. Which is scandalous, right? Because God is God, and this is kind of a puny earth, and you know what's showing us that even more and more is the James Webb Telescope. We're incredibly small. But God, somehow, he cares about us, you know? Uh, that's a pretty cool thing, but it's, it's a little scandalous, right, that God would care about us. Not to him, but, you know, to people who are thinking right. right? Um, okay, well, let's move on. So the other thing I wanted to discuss today, and we've got to go really fast here, is what is a human being? Uh, I'm going to go... 
Oh man, I gotta go really fast. So, uh, human being, let's go through this. I'm, I'm gonna, oh shoot, we did it again. I did it again. So we're made in the image of God. Probably the most important thing that you could know about human beings is we're made in the image of God. That means that we represent God's authority on the earth, that we, have, we, have, we are like God in some key ways. So God is self-reflective, we're self-reflective. God has personality, we have personality. Um, we are created uh, with intelligence and creativity. So God's a creator, and guess what we can do? We can't create out of nothing, but we can take the things that God created and create with them. So when somebody's an artist, that is actually showing the image of God in them. Um, we're good. God makes humans to be good. Now, there's a distinction here that we are good with respect to our being. That's when you see the word on your outline that says ontologically good. That's our, our existence is good. A human being is a good thing. But we're fallen, so we're morally evil. Okay, so ontologically good, morally evil. So when people say, like, do you think that humans are basically good or basically evil? I mean, I typically ask, well, in what way? Okay. We're basically evil with respect to our sin. But we're basically good with respect to our being, our existence. Um, and we're moral agents. So we're unlike animals. Animals can't sin. Our thoughts and actions have moral value. And we have a purpose. I'm going very fast through this. And I've given you scripture references here. Uh, we, we have a purpose. Isaiah 43 says that we're created for God's glory. But we're created to love others too. This is why the, the first commands have to do with loving one another and caring for one another. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have children. This is a good thing. And to rule the earth. You know, uh, fill the earth and subdue it. This is why, you know, you're going to work in the new heavens and the new earth. I don't know if you ever thought about that before. Because God tells Adam and Eve, hey, I want you to, to fill the earth and subdue it. I want you to work. And in the new heavens and the new earth, you're going to keep doing that. It's just not going to be toil. It's, it's not going to be bothersome to you. It's going to be enjoyable. And you want to know how I know that you're going to work in the new heavens and the, and the new earth? Because that mandate that was given in the garden, God never canceled it out. He never said, hey, that's not the rule anymore. But also because in Revelation, there's this scene where it talks about the kings of the earth bringing their gifts before the Lamb. But you don't have gifts to bring unless you work to make them. It's just not going to be toilsome. It's not going to be awful. It'll be good things to do. That should, that should be helpful, too, because you probably have had some work in your lives at some point where you thought, hey, I enjoyed that. Well, you'll probably enjoy the work that you're doing in the new heavens and the new earth. Um, if you like to cook, we're going to have bodies we'll need to eat, right? So you'll probably do that. You know, if you like to play sports or uh, I was thinking about you, how do you, you be teaching people how to, how to exercise? Why, why, would you not, why would you not do that? You'd be reading and writing great books. Good stuff. Okay, uh, wow, dualism, shoot. Okay, yeah, so <laughs> you are a body and a soul. That's where we're dual. We're not Gnostic dualists. The Gnostics believe that your soul was really the most important thing about you and your body was actually evil. Um, it was an early Christian heresy that your body was evil, your soul was good. But both of those things are good. This is actually really important for just how you think about yourself. Because if your body is really good, well, you better take care of it. I, I teach this to my undergrads all the time because like a lot of times when, when somebody's like just a young kid, they never think about like what they're doing to their body. They just think like, yeah, I mean, like I know God cares about my soul and I ask him for forgiveness, but God cares whether or not you're eating well and exercising. He cares about what you see and what you do, right? Your body's actually a really important thing, right? Uh, that's important. We all need to think about that. We've got to take care of ourselves because your body is good. So don't screw it up, <laughs> right? You don't have enough fallenness to make it, make it hard on your body already, right? The world is a tough place, so it's going to make it hard on your body already. Well, don't make it worse by, you know, not eating right or not sleeping enough. And sleeping enough, that's my issue. I, I need to sleep more. Okay. Um, I have some great arguments for why I think we have souls. You'll have to catch me on that some other time. I'm going to go past all of these reasons, supporting arguments for substance dualism, that you are a body and a soul, there's some great reasons to think this. We talked about the placebo effect with the men last week. That's one of them. Um, we'll move on from that, though. I want to talk just in the last couple minutes about are Christians anti-LGBTQ? Because the human, human beings, you see this in the garden, that God initiates marriage. And the story of romantic and sexual relationships from a Christian perspective is that romantic and sexual relationships are between, between one man and one woman. And one of the most important purposes of that is having children. Okay? 
Again, this is creation. The fall makes this all harder in a number of ways, right? You can't just keep having kids forever, right? At some point, I think we talked about this with the ladies last week. Like, you just can't. At some point, you got to be like, I can't have more kids, right? <laughs> and that's fine. But you have to be open to it anyway, in principle, that God can bless you with a child, right? Children are a blessing. They're not a curse. They're a good thing. Um, but that, that concept is really inaugurated in the garden. Adam and Eve committed to each other, one husband and one wife, for life. Um, this is why when people say, like, well, look at all these Christian heroes had lots of wives. Well, that wasn't a good thing. The fact that David had lots of wives is not good. And you see that in how his life played out. His, life, his children had, had all kinds of issues. We can get into all that. But Solomon, too. All these Christian heroes, like they, did, they were sinning by doing this. This was bad that this happened this way. Okay? Wasn't that how God designed it? Okay? Well, I think Romans 1 is a place where we should actually look at the Scripture for just a quick second here. Um, so go to Romans 1 if you would. Because the fall means that bad things are going to happen to our romance and our sexuality. Okay, so this is in verse 18. Uh, and if you have your Bible, I'm not, you can just kind of scroll through it while I talk about it. It talks about God's wrath being revealed. Because people suppress the truth in their wickedness. They know that God exists, but they actually uh, suppress it. God has made himself known, but they didn't glorify God. They didn't give thanks to him. Um, they claimed to be wise. They ended up worshiping idols and images instead of the actual God himself. The things that God made rather than the maker. Look at verse 24. Therefore God gave them over in, sinful, in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. What does that say? First thing is the cause. Why are people gay? Because we are all idolatrous. Not the gay people are idolatrous. What Romans just said is that humanity has suppressed the truth in its wickedness. We worship idols, and because of that, some people end up doing what it's described there. You have shameful lusts. Okay? That's the story of the Bible. Gay people are not bad because they're gay. They're gay because we are all idolatrous. That's what Romans 1 teaches. So who's responsible for this? Well, we are. That's the most important thing you can know. We're responsible for this. Now, is it unnatural? Yes. It goes against nature. God made nature to work in a, in a way. And we've denied what nature is. God made humans male and female. It's very clear in the Bible. But what happens when the fall comes around? Well, you're going to have people who get mixed up about that. They'll get mixed up about what nature is and what natural is. Does that make sense? So when somebody says, like, hey, am I actually really a girl? Like, of course that's going to happen. Because we get all confused about what natural is because we're idolatrous. If we mix up worshiping the creator and start worshiping the creation instead, then we've mixed up what nature really is. And so we're going to get confused and messed up about this stuff. Okay? There's going to be problems, is what this is saying, because of this. Um, and so, yeah, you're going to have men who are, who are attracted to men. And when people say, like, are you born this way? My tendency is to say, well, in a way, yeah, kind of. Because we have, we have been idolatrous. There's going to be people who are just naturally attracted to the same gender, the same sex. All right? Now, in terms of the, are we actually born like this? It's been very difficult to find any kind of genetic link between homosexuality and like your actual gene. Uh, your, your, uh, and actually, I linked um, in the resources an article on this, or it's a video, by Dr. Christopher Yuan, who's a same-sex attracted Christian. He lives a celibate life. Um, and he says, yeah, you know, there's very little link between genetics and somebody being gay. But I don't think that's even the point, because you're not just a set of genes. You're a soul, too, right? You're a soul and a body. And so, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people are just kind of born. I mean, I, 
I have, I have a very close loved one. Always was attracted to the same sex. And, I, and there's, there's people who, are, who live in heterosexual marriages who, will, who always have some kind of temptation for the same sex. Just a part of our lives. Some people have predispositions to alcoholism or to lying. We all have a predisposition to pride. And if you don't think you're prideful, you're the most prideful one here. <laughs> right? We all have these things. These are natural results of the fall. When the fall happens, this all gets mixed up. So is Christianity anti-gay? Well, no. In a very deep way, no. We are for the gay person. We are 100% loving and for the gay person. Do we think that everything a gay person does is good? No, of course not. We're against sin. We're absolutely against sin. When God, when God sets up his moral system, it's that a man would have sex with his wife. So for that reason, we're against men having sex with other women who are not his wife. Right? We're against all of these things in terms of sin. But for the gay person, we are 100% for that person. And, uh, and you want to know why? <laughs> Well, there's a great story for this. And this is the last thing I'll do, Brenda, if that's okay. I'm sorry. I just, I got to tell the story. We'll, we'll go to, we'll go to the breakout, though. This is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. This is one of the most beautiful stories where you have a man who's in a kind of gender gray space. Why is he in a gender gray space? He's a eunuch. Typically, that meant his, his, he was castrated in a violent way. Um, typically, if you served in the court of, of a royal official in the ancient world, your, your being a eunuch was a part of you being subdued as the king's enemy. That's typically how it worked. You'd be, you, you, your rebellion against the king would have failed, and your permanent humiliation would have been to be castrated and brought into the king's court to serve in his harem or something like that. That's your permanent humiliation. Um, so this man knew shame and suffering, this eunuch. And what is it that he's reading? And this is in Acts 8. He's reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And all of the passages that he re he's reading are from the suffering servant passages in Isaiah. Passages that are talking about Jesus. And they say things like this. And who could speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. So this eunuch is reading these stories about Jesus. These prophecies. And what is Jesus saying to him? I understand what it's like to have your ability to have children taken away from you. So what Jesus is saying for this person in this gender gray space, I know what it is to feel ashamed in your own body. Because what would a Jewish rabbi be expected to do? Marry and have children. Do you think Jesus probably wanted to? Yeah, he probably did. He was fully human in every way. Except for his, he didn't sin, right? So he probably wanted to get married and have children. He knew what it was like to be ashamed in his own body. That's why it's important that he was naked on the cross. Very sad, awful thing. Jesus understands this man, is the, is the moral of this story. And if and when it, in, in Acts 8, it says that Philip explained this to him, and it says, starting from the passage, which is the suffering servant passage, he explained the gospel to him. Well, if he would have kept reading in the scroll of Isaiah, very shortly after the passages that the eunuch was reading, he would have come across passages like this. This is uh, Isaiah 56. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. I want to. I wish I could camp on this for so much longer. <laughs> I've preached like whole sermons on this passage. So, what is what is happening here? It's that for the person who has their gender, their sexuality mixed up, Jesus is saying that I'm going to give you something that's even better than having natural children. Something better, a memorial that's stronger and more pure. It'll be a memorial in my temple. That your name will be in my temple. And so for the LGBTQ person, the gospel is not just that Jesus forgives you of your sins. That's, of course, part of the gospel. He forgives you of your sins. But it's that all of your brokenness will be redeemed. All of it will actually turn out to be better than it was 
because you went through the brokenness. And it's not that God wanted you to go through the brokenness, but he will make it even more beautiful than if you hadn't. Because the eunuch could have, had he not been castrated, had children, and that would have been good. But what this is saying is that I'm going to give you something even better than having natural children. And so I think as Christians, we, we need to preach the full gospel to the gay person, to the trans person. The full gospel is that Jesus, of course, forgives you of your sins, but he wants to redeem everything about your life and make it that much more beautiful for you having gone through the hell of, of thinking I'm a male, but I think I'm actually a woman. That is hell to go through that. When you read the stories about people who have these surgeries, it is hellish what they go through. Taking hormones and having somebody tell you, well, okay, we're going to take off your breasts now. And if you decide to change your mind later, you, of course, can. But you can't, you find out. And you live in constant pain and shame for the rest of your life. Well, who else lived in this constant pain and shame? Jesus on the cross was in pain and ashamed. And he understands and has a greater redemption for all of this. We get stuck in the politics of this issue because our world's just nuts about the trans stuff right now. And the world is truly nuts about the trans stuff right now. But we need to be gospel people about this issue. Okay. I'm going to let us go into, into discussion now. Um, so, because uh, we, we need to be done. But um, anyway, happy to talk more about these things.